Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. We have a wonderful um, continuation of last week's discussion with um, a variety of different panelists and um, a, a guest panelist who will be presenting um, her findings and her research. Um, my name is Tanya Reiskind, and I am sitting in for Kathy Leach, who is the Executive Director of the International Montessori Council. And these webinars are brought to you weekly, um, free, um, through the Montessori Foundation. But because of the richness of today's activities, that's all I'm going to say about it. Mm -hmm. um, our panelists today are um, Michael Doerr, who is a senior consultant with the Montessori Foundation, Sarah Lavalley, who works closely with Cindy Acker and I believe is um, Director of Equity for Cindy's Schools. Welcome, Sarah. Uh, Christine Lowry, who is a regular panelist and senior consultant with the Montessori Foundation as well. And Cindy Acker, who is a senior consultant with the Montessori Foundation. Um, um, the past <laughs> involvement with a variety Variety of not-for-profit organizations relating to children. She is an advocate and the uh, founder and owner of um, two schools, Cindy, Child Unique, two campuses. Um, and so welcome, Cindy. And she will lead and guide today's webinar. And thank all of you for coming. Um, we really appreciate all of the energy and spirit of coming together during these times. So I'd like to start by, um, Sarah, if you can show Dr. Fauci, I'd like to start by showing a very short piece of the testimony that um, Dr. Fauci gave. He is a head um, person for the CDC and he gave Senate testimony. And there's a section that has to do with children that I thought would be wonderful for us to be able to start with. Sarah, do you have that? Uh, Tanya, do I have screen sharing capabilities? Yes, you should. I is that it? Did I get there? No. Uh, you, I, tell me where that. I thought I thought you were making me have that. So I. I yeah, uh, on your other computer, you were presenter. So hold I on. A presenter, so. I will make sure I get you again. And there you go. You should be able to do that. Yes. All right. But as I mentioned in my opening remarks, even at the top speed we're going, we don't see a vaccine playing in the ability of individuals to get back to school this term. We don't know everything about this virus, and we really better be very careful, particularly when it comes to children, because the more and more we learn, we're seeing things about what this virus can do that we didn't see from the studies in China or in Europe. For example, right now, children presenting with COVID-19, COVID who actually have a very strange inflammatory syndrome, very similar to Kawasaki syndrome. I think we better be careful if we are not cavalier in thinking that children are completely immune to the deleterious effects. So again, you're right in the numbers that children in general do much, much better than adults and the elderly, and particularly those with underlying conditions. But I'm very careful, hopefully humble, and knowing that I don't know everything about this disease. And that's why I'm very reserved in making broad predictions. And there's no guarantee. Thank you, Sarah. Perfect. And so if you can scoot out of that and into the PowerPoint, that would be terrific. The, the thing that I thought was most interesting about that information, and we've been hearing a lot of things that have to do with um, COVID-19 and odd kinds of things that have to do with children. And everybody has been saying a lot of different things that they've been hearing. And the one thing that is very clear um, is that we don't know. We we really don't know what we don't know. And so the, the best thing that I found when I was working with the issue of communicable diseases back in the AIDS years is that you the responsibility of an educator is to protect themselves and children from, from anything and everything. And if you do your work well, and you do it as though it is something that is a part of your, your daily 
obligation and your daily duties, then you don't have to freak out over what could happen or what you should be doing or how to do that differently. And so what I did was to um, vamp up um, the protocol that we have at my school for communicable diseases and to create something that was um, connected closely to COVID-19. And so I'm just gonna walk you through um, what we have here. And Cindy, um, this PowerPoint, it has been uploaded in the handout section for people to have. Um, and we have two handouts we could not upload, um, but we will make sure participants have access to them somewhere through the foundation. Also, there's a question box, um, which I will be monitoring. So please feel free to type in your questions. Okay. Um, so what I want to make clear about any of the information that is here is that if there is a law that is stricter than any guideline that is in this information, it behooves you to follow the law. You, you follow the stricter guideline um, at any point. So if there is a conflict between what the state says and what the county says and what your city says, it is better for you to adhere to what is the, the stricter guideline in whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and to know that any information that you get, you should make sure that it's come from a particular source and not just something that somebody has said, um, because we don't wanna play around with this. And that um, anything that is said, even if it comes from the CDC or the National Institutes of Health, it's changing by the day. And that that's the piece that we just have to hold is that we we really we don't know. It's a part of the challenge and when should schools open, um, when should other things open, whether or not something starts to open and then um, the reins are pulled back in, whether there's going to be another wave or not. All of that is in question. And so we're just going to we're, we're just going to live in the question and um, and continue to do our work. Go ahead, Sarah. So what i did was to get information that is based on information from the cdc from the california child care health project cushman and wakefield has um a, an interesting um, packet which is one of the things that tanya probably was referring to that just has to do with opening up your building after there has been something like this that has gone on and things that you need to take care of and then i connected with schools in taiwan and china um, and tried to find out what were all of the things that they were doing there. And then I tried to incorporate all of it and they're still sending me information. And so my document is going to be changing as well. Um, and then I, I wanted to just mention South Loop Montessori School in Chicago because it's in there because they are a school that opened up to um, serve children of essential workers. So, you can look at that, that is really clear that children are a different kind of variable that we have to look at differently. And it's been a part of the challenge that everyone has had. Um, there's a woman who I sent this PowerPoint to who's a former um, assistant head in the CDC and she now works for Merck. And she was saying that uh, they have a preschool for their employees and they're still battling with what to do um, when it comes to children because children are just a completely different um, d different animal than um, than adults. You you have to consider many other factors, and so that's what we're hoping to do here. I don't know if you can call that up or not. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Cindy, did I jump that? No, it's okay. Um, if you can get to that piece quickly, then we'll we'll do it. Are you on it? It should, you should be sick. Parents uh, need to know that we owe them a responsibility to maintain high standards across all preschools. We have 400 operators running 1,900 preschools. And we owe it to parents to make sure that the measures we put in place are evidence based are precautionary, are sensible, are practically implemented on the ground, not just people exercise, but on the ground, they are being practically implemented. 
And that is why my colleagues at ECDA, myself, my colleagues at Senior Management of the Ministry, have for the last few months been visiting preschools, visiting residential homes, visiting social services uh, to see the measures for the various uh, sectors and subsectors being implemented in those sectors on the ground. Thank you, sir. And giving support to our frontline. And so that that's just a clip from the Singapore government that just tells us that um, we have a responsibility to our parents and it's a dance um, that we definitely are going to have to play, that we, we discover ways that we can maintain the authenticity of Montessori education and that we can be honorably um, responsible to our parents for the lives of the children and as heads of school that we are as well responsible to the lives of our staff. Keep going. Um, and so Cushman and Wakefield's information, and I hope you're able to get um, this a copy of this, um, talks to you about the fact that you need to make sure that your building is prepared, that your staff are prepared, that your, your controls, that, that things within the building are taken care of, that you have a plan for social distancing, that you are responsible enough to reduce touch points, um, because every touch point in your school is a potential point of infection um, and that you communicate well with parents, with staff, which re requires training. If you open your school and your staff walk back in the door and there hasn't been extensive training about what they need to do differently, then you've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Sarah, go ahead. And so this shows you, which is one of the wonderful things about this document that Cushman and Wakefield um, presented is all of the different ways that you need to analyze your building before you start. Go ahead. Um, and so the basic information from CDC are things that everybody has probably listened to, the importance of hand washing, social distancing strategies, with the, with the difference that many people have made the assumption that the six feet requirement for adults is the requirement for children. The CDC and licensing definitely recognize that it is impossible to be able to do that, um, that children are children and that we, we would probably be considered people who have neglected children if we maintained a six foot distance when a child actually needs to have our connection. It, it, it isn't possible. In our school, what that has meant for us is that we have put our responsibility on ourselves as leaders of the school to protect our staff in the best way possible. Um, and so we are, we've, we've come up with and are coming up with um, examples of how we separate the shelves, um, making sure that we have independent work tables. Um, and while there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of information out there about using hula hoops and things like that to define children's space, we've been hoping to just maintain the integrity of Montessori in a different way. Um, and so we, we are hoping to have the shelves and you'll see it later in the document, other things that we're using to be able to maintain the same kind of distance with differing kinds of language that we use in communication with children um, so that so that we we don't make the mistake of ruining the child's self-image um, and that we just do a dance between protecting the image of the child and their own their own dignity and protecting their safety. Um, we have policies for children. You can go back, Sarah. We have policies for no the other one. Sorry. Screening children. Um, I mentioned partitions. Um, we are we are making sure that our staff have protective equipment, um, that we've upped our disinfection um, procedures, um, and that we have we have moved up our presentations of hand washing for practical life, that we're gonna spend a lot more time on how to take care of self, others in the environment and have a different meaning for that um, in practical life. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, and then this is a part of what we have, have charged ourselves with needing to look at, <clears throat> that we recognize 
that not everybody can afford supplies. So we're making sure that we have those for our staff and that we have those for our children, um, that we pay attention to the fact that parents who speak different languages, we want to make sure they understand what we're changing in our policies. And so we have to make sure that they have access by having that information in their language. Um, that there are some practices that culturally will be very different for people and that we need to be able to look at that and that we need to pay attention to the, the sensitivity of racial biases and how that ends up falling into place with people. So when you talk about social distance and you connect that with race or you connect that with gender or you connect that with culture, it's a thing that we really have to take care of in a different way because we don't want children to start to use that in a way or assume in a way that they are being separated out because of who they are and not because of this virus. Go ahead. So, so we divided up into possible stages and I know that, um, who was it? Mary Beth had, had a, um, a document that, that was separated in stages also um, that did other kinds of things. So this is where we are now, shelter in place. And then stage two is limited enrollment, which is where in California, where um, California sits, um, they're at the first phase of um, limited, limited in what we would consider limited enrollment, where it's essential workers plus a slight extension to that definition of essential workers. And so if we were open now, and we will be open shortly, um, we would be operating under, um, under stage two and going into stage three. And so stage three is a limited opening, stage four is full opening. And what, what I decided was that we were going to begin with a small group of children so that we knew we could do this right. And so that's, that's our pilot, so to speak. So we're gonna start with six children per classroom and we're just going to make sure that we can go through all of the things that we need to in order for the school to, um, to function well and to keep everyone safe. And one of the things that some of my staff have asked is, well, how long are we gonna be in that stage? And I said, you know, it really depends on, on how well we do and how, how it's going. It could be that it's a couple of weeks, it could be that it's a couple of days that we discover we have it, we're good. Um, and so then we can start to open the school up fully when, when the, the government allows us to do that. So what you see down, down below where it says parent financial obligation, and we went through many different aspects of how, how each stage would impact different parts of the school. And so we came up with what for us ended up working with our parents so far. And so um, we maintained full tuition at one point, and then at one point we um, we took off the extended care part and just charged the um, school tuition. And then as we started to have parents who were getting furloughed and parents who were starting to have um, difficulty because both of them lost their jobs, um, they just could not pay the tuition. It was just impossible for them. And so we created a cafeteria plan for tuition so that parents could, on the honor system, um, fill out what their circumstance was. And if they couldn't pay as much tuition, it would, they had a place where they could say, I've been furloughed or I have a special circumstance and then a spot for them to be able to indicate that for us. And so um, we, we allow for that to be able to be a part of that. Sarah, go ahead. I have a question, Cindy, which is a perfect time. Um, thank you, Margaret Whiteley is asking, how did you decide which children would be in the first cohort? Thank you. Um, the first opening in California was for children of essential workers. So with each stage of opening, they opened childcare preschools up to be able to serve the children of those families. And so we put out a survey to parents um, saying, are you an essential worker? Do you work from the home? Do you need um, your child to be in school? Um, how soon do you need to have this happen? And then we decided that we would see how that rolled out and um, that we would start with six per class. 
And what we did ask, I should, I should mention, is for anyone who said, yes, they are an essential worker, we asked for their workplace and their occupation. Um, and we had that information in school, but we thought because people change jobs that we would ask that at the present moment, what is your what is your workplace and what is your occupation, so that we could establish that they are an essential worker. Cindy, we're getting a few more questions that are kind of drilling down into the process you used. Lynn Barras asks, how do you support those students who won't be part of the initial cohort? And Kathy Lopez Cooling asks, can you explain the outbreak column and how that is defined? Sure. Um, we can we had remote learning going on and still do and will and even when we open we have a number of parents who are just frightened and want to continue with remote learning and our remote learning program has been pretty robust um sarah do you want to explain a little bit of that i'm sorry what was that you want to explain a little bit about the remote learning program Oh, sure. The, for, for our remote learning program, we have um, established a um, work plan that goes out to all the parents every day. It's in a sort of a beautifully designed um, constant contact sheet that ha has broken down the children into their age group, whether toddler, primary, or, or elementary, and then within that broken down into further groups, and then an enrichment section. So they're getting uh, lesson, uh, work plans that include lessons and videos. We have staff who are making videos on a regular basis. We've got probably over 150, maybe 200 videos at this point that are used in these work plans. We then on top of that have um, daily Zoom lessons. Um, and those are based on um, the age groups. So we have them for toddlers, we have them for the primary kids, and we have them for the the elementary elementary school kids have them uh once a day but for a very long they haven't for a whole hour and then they have an afternoon circle all together and the toddlers have 45 minutes where they get to to two two 45 minute sessions where they get to really have fun and be with their teachers and each other and it's surprising because there are parents who don't want to have their children in front of a screen but there are also a good number that are finding that to be a real advantage to both their child and to themselves. So we're we're finding it both ways. And then parents get a weekly one-on-one -on -one, and the one-on-one -on -one can be with the child or with the parent um, or both if they need it. And so we're trying to we're trying to touch families in a multiple different ways that will address what their need is and what their their mode of learning is. Some kids learn better when they when they're sitting down at the table by themselves. Some are learning better if they can see the teacher. So and we're trying there, to address all And then there are there are Capoeira um, interactive lessons. There's Mandarin, Arabic, French, and Spanish. And so there's there's quite a bit. So that and we deliver um, packets of information to parents who don't want to do screen time and um, seeds and soil for planting and things like that. And so there are the we have said to parents, lean in or lean out to the extent that you and your child can do that. Um, none of that is pressure. And we're just providing enough that is available. And we have allowed um, our primary and toddler students to, to cross learn as though they were coming in and sitting in on a lesson. Um, so anybody can, can sit in on any lesson at all. And anyone can ask a teacher for one-on-one -on -one time as well. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty robust. Thank you, Cindy. Um, how many adults will be with the group of six? Carrie Moran, thank you. We will have one teacher with each group of six, and then we will expand the number of children. Okay. Um, and okay. I didn't mention the outbreak section, which is if there if there is an outbreak in the school, an outbreak, a child is infected, or a staff person is infected, or a parent is infected um how do things change for the school and part of that is predicated on what the health department tells you because um, you report to them first and then they will guide what it is that is necessary whether the classroom has to close down and be quarantined whether the school has to close down um, and so we will take our guidance from that 
Can and I, I would you? suggest that some questions may be answered further on in the in the presentation. Correct. Yep. I'm going to keep the questions to where you are, Cindy. Okay. Okay. Great. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Uh, Cindy, with the group of six that you're having in the classrooms, are those the same six children every day, all day, or do you alternate in some way so that you reach more children over the period of a week or so? Um, they are the same children, and we'll, we'll, we'll actually get in the slide how we came to that decision. Okay, okay thank you. Sure. Okay, Sarah. Um, and then this is modes of curriculum. So what I just described that we're doing now is in the left column. And then this just shows that depending on the stage, we will have co a combination of remote learning and, um, and children in the classroom. Go ahead. And, and I would say that an outbreak is a further explanation of what happens um, if, there were a, if there were a quarantine required. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, and then composition, which is kind of what Michael was talking about, we labored back and forth between whether or not we should have AM and PM classes versus um, two or three day classes or how we were going to do that. And what, what I did in looking at this is to look at the human nature of my staff. and. I, to me, over time, the disinfecting that would be required between the AM and the PM children would start to break down. Mm -hmm. um, and then we open up the possibility of, of a spread of infection. And then if we do, we've lost everybody because if they all have to be um, quarantined, then we've completely lost the classroom. And so it is, um, and Sarah, I think the next one may have my, my yes. This is an example of the extent to which deep disinfecting needs to happen. And this is what is happening in China. It's a lot. It's not just wiping the shelves quickly, which is what a teacher may do when they're at the end of their classroom day. It's really disinfecting. It's making sure that any touched surface has been cared for. And that, I. I just can't see that consistently we would do it every day. So I didn't even want to put put my school in that position because I know it would break down. So and what's important for this document that that those are options that are possible and have to be explored for each school. Yes. So um so we are going to do full class days um and and depending on how many children we have, what, what we have um, been looking at is how can we divide the classroom? And so we made contact with the health department to find out how high would a divider need to be in order to be able to separate a classroom and to end up having two groups of 10 students. And we were told relatively six feet. And so we looked at that being shelving or something like that, um, and our being able to also make sure that the room is very well ventilated. And um, it, at one school, we're, we're doing HVAC there, um, but making sure that we have air conditioning and that, that the building is, that the rooms are circulating. And so that's, that's what we're playing with now and that's a part of what we're going to look at when we have six and then we move that to ten and then can we actually do this well with a, a divider in between um, with ten and ten children go ahead sarah go ahead okay um, yes it is and then um how we have come across ideas for healthy distancing guidelines and so we've literally come up with games that we can do outside. And we have a teacher who's been working on um, um, floor plans so that floor plans and yard plans so that we can see where we can um, have children with different kinds of games. Um, we are requiring our staff to wear N95s and a surgical mask. And so school is providing those for them um, because N95s provide Ooh, the Cindy? protection closer yet. 
Hmm. Did someone say something? Okay. No, you cut out for a moment. Oh, okay. Um, so our staff is wearing N95s and a surgical mask, which we are providing for them um, as better protection for them. Um, we have children's masks, which are optional. We are not mandating it, but we are making them available to parents um, uh, for children who are over two years old. Um, we're, I know that some schools are completely undoing circle time. We wanna be able to have, have circle happen, but to maximize the space. And what I have said to my staff is, this is where the Montessori indoor-outdoor classroom can absolutely flourish that to the extent that we can do it, that we need to be able to really make use of the outdoors in a way that we have not before. Mm -hmm. um, and to have shelves outside and to have tables outside when, when the weather permits that. Um, there's one public school, I mean, um, public health guideline that said, um, if it's lousy weather and you can put um, canopies outside and allow the children to work that way, consider that. So we're, we're just trying to, throw the box out, not even think out of the box, but have no box in all of the possible ways that um, that we can allow children to work. And we have even looked at, um, so that we don't disturb the three hour work period, that children are able to look at their bodies and pay attention to their bodies like they do for snack. And when they're ready for lunch, that we do small group that just go out and they go out to eat um, and that there's small groups out and then they come back in and um, as opposed to having it look like military everybody you take this clump and you put them here and you take this clump of children and you put them somewhere else um, and so it it means that we have to just really look at the flexibility of the space um, i can remember teaching toddlers and i was an indoor teacher at one point and there was an outdoor teacher and we used to flow and the children moved as they chose to and where it worked best for them and so it it may be a lot of that where children some children are working out some children are working in some children are eating lunch um, but that we're going to um, rotate that out as it organically can happen cindy are you planning on having two teachers for six toddlers we have at one of our campuses, we have a toddler option and we have to have a one to four ratio. And so there we will have, we have 18 month olds and so we have to. Um, at our other campus, we will start in the same way. We will have, we'll have um, six children and there we're gonna start with two teachers just so that we can monitor toddlers and how they are. So during stage two and stage three, we will do that and then we'll open it up. We are hoping, hoping by the time we um, are at um, a larger opening that we'll have, we'll have one teacher um, with 10 children and that we'll have someone who is just disinfecting. Sarah, go ahead. And so we're just really looking at the classroom as we would at the very beginning of the school year, uh, where we help children to have divisions of space and that we're just gonna maintain that. So we're going to have, and this isn't our school, but it's just an example, closest example that I could find on the internet of paying attention to how you can separate a classroom. And so we're going to use our shelves um, to allow for individual tables for children. And if we happen to have a very long table, I just consulted with a school, they have a table that's four feet long. And so they are turning the table and putting two shelves on either side so that there's a child on one end and a child on the other end. Sarah, go ahead. Um, and same thing, it's like making sure that um, the space, and we are not going to use cloth rugs um, we're going to use something that's a little closer to an oil cloth um, for the children to work on. But it's just really becoming inventive about how you help children to create space. And so this is a school that 
did that with tape and the children were doing something outdoors and they're not six feet apart but they certainly could do that um, and just make those kinds of things available and so this was kind of what we were talking about with staff that we're going to have um, we'll start with um, one to six and so we're going to have a teacher who starts in the morning and a teacher who comes in, in the midday so that 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 teacher ends the day and those two adults will be the ones with that group of children during that time period. Go ahead, Sarah. And this is some of the interesting kinds of things that you can do with dividers. This is Lucite um, and it's just a way to not make it seem so closed off, um, is just to do something that is clear. Um, and so um, we're gonna experiment with that a bit with some ways to divide the classroom up in a way that um, still gives the children the social um, connection in seeing their buddies, um, but able to have some individual space. Sarah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, and our um, our arrival and our departure protocol is um, is very different. Um, we are not going to allow parents in, um, and we we have a debate going on with staff as to whether how can we protect the social connection that parents have with each other because we were going to just do car line. And we were trying to figure out how can we help parents to be able to have that connection. And um, in China, um, they gave us uh, their, they just mark out six feet and the parents come and they're six feet apart. Um, and I thought, mm, I, you know, I don't know that I, I wanna do that, I'm not quite sure. So right now we're going to have parents in cars and, um, and they will sign and, and drop off. Um, but they need to stay until the child has had their temperature taken and we have um, touchless um, thermometers that teachers are responsible for assessing the health of the child and that has always been a mandate that you accept children in as healthy, um, that we ask children to wash their hands and face and we have always asked for hand washing before the child walks into the classroom. That has been a policy of the school for quite some time. Um, and that uh, that teachers have their masks on at all times, um, and that prior to school opening, that everything is disinfected. So, Cindy, one of the um, questions, thank you, Horesha da Silva, is um, how are you managing your faculty who are going to be on site with children? And then while that's happening, you're still going to continue your online program. So how are you managing the faculty who are online doing your online programming at the same time you're having faculty on campus? Um, you know, we have we have half of our staff um, has been doing the remote learning program, and there are a number of staff who are still afraid to come back, um, who are fearful um, because they have they live with grandparents or they live with parents, and they're concerned about um, coming back to school. And so, some of them will be the people who will be handling the remote learning program. And then we have um, we have other staff people, part of our admin staff, who monitor how that's going. They they click in and they observe and look at the lessons that are being given and things like that. And so that will be able to still um, continue to happen. So we have um, 32 people on staff, and um, and so some of them will be in the classroom, some of them will be doing remote learning for for a little while. So that's Carline pickup. Go ahead, Sarah. And you know, I the reason why I put that up is because some people have said to me, it's so difficult to have to do this every morning. And I I wanted to say it's not so difficult. Um, it is something that everybody should be doing anyway. You're looking for particular kinds of things 
um, with a child and you can greet. I used to have this wonderful teacher who just was on his knees and he greeted everybody on his knees and in a heartbeat, he was, he was able to, to check the child out, to look them in the eyes and to know that it looked to him that they were well. So the only additional piece to that is the thermometer, which is pretty quick because it's not putting it in any orifice. It's just um, holding it up to the head. And so I'm, I'm sure a number of people have seen this video. Have you seen this? Sarah, can you? Was that just a picture or is that the video? It's just a picture. Okay. So um, what you see there um, in Taiwan is a health check. They're doing it outside and you can go on YouTube and watch it. But literally they are, they have someone who's spraying the, the child's feet and then the child um, and they, they bow to each other um, in the morning and then um, the child goes through and they have their temperature taken. They even have a machine that is there that can assess whether or not you have hand, foot and mouth, et cetera, et cetera, just by putting your face up against it. And um, then they, I think there they give them a, a spray and then they go into the classroom. But the entire thing is probably two minutes. Sarah, go ahead. Yep. Um, and so the disinfection, I would say, are the same kinds of things that we would need to do at any other time. The difference is that the children, the materials that each child has touched um, need to be disinfected. And so what I came up with was creating um, tiny laminate yield signs so that after a child has worked with the material, they put a yield sign on the material when they put it away. Um, and that's the key to the adult that that material needs to be disinfected. Go ahead. Yep. Um, this is South Loop Montessori School in Chicago and they are open to essential workers. And what you see there is the director who's um, doing a thermometer check. So she's just waving it in front of the child um, and her process just didn't take that long in the morning. Go ahead. Um, and then we looked at um, facilities care different kinds of things that we needed to do. Um, we have a campus where the church uh, is the landlords and they have carpets in there. And so we're doing carpet cleaning um, on a biweekly basis. And we also have on top of the carpet in some places where we had for practical life, we had wood paneling. Um, and so we will have that as well um, for practical life and a couple of other areas in the classroom. Um, in the building, one of the buildings that um, we own, um, we're having the carpets ripped out and we're just having a wood floor um, because it's where the toddlers are and it's just, um, just more in need of regular kinds of cleaning. Cindy, in all of this, um, do you anticipate having to hire new staff? or different staff, or you're trying to stay within your own staff requirements. And I apologize for not calling your name out for all the questions, thank you. But in the interest of time, because I know that this is a very um, in-depth slideshow that has will probably answer almost everyone's questions eventually. And so I'm targeting specific questions that I know aren't specifically in the slideshow. Sure. Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I I wonder whether or not we will have some staff who will feel that they can never come back, that the fear of all of this will take over and that they won't feel like they can never come back. And if we, if, if our remote program ends up petering and parents feel more comfortable and they come back to school, I think there is the risk that we might lose some staff people. I'm hoping um, that because we are being way extra protective that they will start to feel comfortable and 
um, and be able to come back. What I know that we we have are is a need for people to disinfect. That that's the only thing they do um, is that they're in the classrooms and that they're just they're just infection control monitors. Um, that's the additional staff that I feel we need to have because um, I think it's I think it's impossible for a teacher to end up with something um, that they will be able to manage easily themselves, at least for a while. Um, and then this is communication to parents that it's really critical that parents know what the policies are um, and that they have buy-in. Tomorrow night, I have a parent meeting where I'm presenting um, this PowerPoint to my parents and discussing it. I want them to understand why I am saying to them, in essence, yes, I do need you to pay tuition and no, I'm not going to let you get out of your car, you know, and um, we we are not inviting visitors in. We're going to be doing um, virtual school tours. And so it's really, we're protecting the environment um, and safeguarding it, um, kind of in the way that Montessori described it, but we're doing it in a in a medical kind of sense with um, with only allowing the staff and the children to be present. Go ahead. Have you um, purchased your N95 masks or dividers or touchless thermometers yet? And if if not, where are you planning on purchasing them? I know that some states, the Department of Education is purchasing them for schools, um, both public and private under um, um, equal access laws. But how about you? Well, to be perfectly honest, I got N95s from China. Um, I um, I went together with some of my teachers who helped me and um, someone who was helping. Um, we were getting N95s for hospitals. And so we, we went to a supplier and we were able to get them shipped from China and um, mm -hmm. and the hospital was really wonderful. They were so thrilled to be able to have them. And so I just started to um, save a a box each time um, for my my staff over time. So I have um, N95s and I have hand sanitizer. Um, I I am I have people on the lookout everywhere to be able to get it. And when we were asked by licensing if we would stay open, I said if you can promise me that you will safeguard my teachers by providing PPE and considering them essential workers um, and the ability to test, then yes, we'll open, but until then not. And so now we have all of that. We have um, those things that, that are needed. Um, we have um, thermometers that are, that we have some and some are um, coming and we have not yet designed the clear lucite dividers, but um, we're we're designing those as we do the floor plan. Sarah, you can go ahead. Um, so we had three slides that have to do with communication, and you can go through those, um, Sarah. But the the Critical, critical elements are communicating with parents, communicating with staff, um, communicating with children, and um, and having everybody on board and prepared to the extent that is possible, so that this becomes second nature. And then this is what happens when we have to look at any kind of emergency um, communication, so that we have a protocol and we know who, who we have to contact. This is an interesting question from Jeff Selhorst. Um, how are you making finances work? Um, in Florida, the governor's current order is 10 people per group, inclusive of staff. Um, um, if um, back at one of those beginning slides in green or purple, it says, do we increase tuition to accommodate these changes question mark um and i think my parent council probably almost threw up when they saw um that question but um but that's something that is definitely 
definitely on the table that it may be that tuition has to go up. It may be that we're saying to parents, you know what? Tuition may not raise, may not go up, but it means that you have got to find mechanisms to be able to, um, to get additional funds. I've also been searching everywhere. Every time I see that there is a grant that is available, um, there, there was an organization um, that's kind of like First Five that um, is giving a grant just for PPE for schools. Um, and so wherever I see things like that, then I send off for them and apply for them for the school. Um, I am also asking parents to donate, um, donate supplies, bring those in. And um, we have parents who have done that. We have a parent who just purchased a, a standalone hand washing thing for outside. Um, because I think parents really want their children to be safe. And so, um, so I'm, I'm going to be saying to them um, when we have our meeting that, um, that this can only happen with them, that the school can, just cannot be expected to, um, to provide everything that's needed. And I'm also looking at the staff that we have who can step up and, and have a group of children on their own. We have a number of people who are interns um, and it's time for them to be able to step up. And so if we have to divide a classroom um, and we have adults who can do that, then, then so be that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and everyone's getting paid. I mean, whether you're online, offline, on campus, off campus, I mean, please be careful. I'm getting some questions about that. You have to follow, you know, employment laws. You can't. Yeah can't people it doesn't matter where they're working if they work you have to pay them that's what this is about so we need to be um and parents need to understand that they're not paying for you know their child at home being online they're paying for um something that they agreed to um participate in so and cindy you can talk about that partnership that you so brilliantly have developed with your parents yeah, you know, we created a document that that breaks down the amount of time that it takes for a teacher to create a video lesson, to do a Zoom lesson and the prep around that. I mean, we just broke it down so that it can't be questioned. It's so like, this is what it takes. This is what my teachers go through um, in order to, to provide the remote learning that your child is getting. Um, and and parents need to need to be able to understand that that our hands are tied because, because teachers who work with preschoolers are not well protected. We can't do six feet distancing. We have to be able to do as much as we can within those guidelines. And parents have to recognize that if they, th this is where the commitment to children hits the fan. It's like, um, if we want to be able to truly take care of children while other people are going out to, to work. And if we're truly going to be educating their children so that they are responsible human beings, we have to have everybody on board. We have to have parents on board. We have to have legislators on board and they just need to do what they need to do in order for it to work. Um, and I think it's organizations like IMC um, that, that need to to make sure that they're being the spokespersons to say you cannot make these regulations and not support our teachers or they they will not be able to continue to do what they're doing go ahead <clears throat> this is similar to the arrival protocol which just has to do with disinfecting the thing that i'll mention is that the very last person makes sure that everything that was touched last gets disinfected. Um, and so we have a process for pens um, that you use your own pen or you use a pen one time and then um, the pen is not used again until it's disinfected. That's an example of if you have people who walk in. Have you ever seen those disin pen disinfecting machines? They actually exist. I was surprised about that. Go ahead. Um, and the key to all of it is just prep. That, I mean, that's key to any Montessori environment. And this is no different, that it's preparation. It's making sure that you have what you need. 
Um, I am asking my staff to test before they start. Um, and testing is only good for the day that you do it, but at least it, it tells us that we're not starting with people who are infected. Um, and I tested, actually I tried to test first, but a teacher went before me because I want, I, I want to make sure that anything I ask of my staff, I'm willing to do as well. Um, and just making sure that there is sufficient training. That is just, uh, we're, we're going to train and then we're going to practice as though we're children so that we can just try to analyze everything that could go wrong. And that is the same director after the arrival time um, who is holding the hand of the child and who is not maintaining a six foot distance because the child needed the, the director walking with her um, outside. Um, and so I just, I wanted that to be the very last slide to, to show um, that that's, that's courage. And that's also just care and love and um, preparation and action. Thank Thanks. you, Cindy. Sure. Panelists, any, thank you. Walking in the world of Maria Montessori, we, this is big work. It is big work. It is big work. And we're still, you know, we're still working through it. We're still working through it. And what's, What's critical is that we keep asking the questions and we keep coming up with what we've tried and what isn't working um, and the ways that we can make this not disrupt the classroom um, in incredible ways that children need to continue to work um, and they need to not have people take materials out of their hand and start spraying because they need to be disinfecting um, and things like that. We need to be able to keep what is organic and natural in, Mont in a Montessori environment, alive and healthy um, and do our, do our work. I mean, it's such a wonderful time for science to take place outdoors and for us to really walk the talk of having an indoor outdoor classroom and creating how we can do that differently with children and allowing them to be the, a part of it, so. I think you've hit upon um, almost every question and I think one question here that is um, resonates with the words you just used, you know, how do we do it in a way that doesn't um, destroy our pedagogical values and our classroom um, preparations? And one of the biggest um, concerns and considerations is food food preparation, how will the children eat? I mean, I know that at my school, you know, do I really want um, 70 lunch boxes if the goal is to have vector contamination touch points controlled as much to our, our you know, as our, within our control as possible those are the vector touch points that we can control. And how does it look for you, Cindy, at this point in your planning process? Well, we've been trying to decide between having a company um, provide lunch for the children or having, we're undoing backpacks for everyone except lower and upper L um, and having, having lunch boxes that come in and they're a part of the process of being disinfected in the morning um but it's not we we haven't sorted that piece that it's it's the other piece that's on the table that we're trying to decide between having a company and um having children um bring in lunch um i think sarah and one other um, staff person felt very strongly that bags are better than having a lunch box if they're going to bring things in because it can just go um, and we're trying to decide that. I thought that um, because it completely changes food prep in a way um, that we would have um, two things that would be available for food prep and we'd have two children who could do it um, in the morning and and make it available again in the afternoon. So kind of like a, a work that um, that you use and then it's it isn't available again. We're not sure. 
we're not sure about that part of it. What we what we definitely figured out is that as as many possibilities for food prep as we would have, it would be one child using it um, for themselves, and that would be it. Yeah, we're, we're so many questions, and it it's a grand experiment, isn't it? Um, yeah, and for regular snack. Um, most public health departments are saying that it has to be prepackaged, that it can't be something else. And so for for food for everybody, um, then we're we're doing we have an incredible RN who does our snack program. And so she is um, researching more um, prepackaged snacks besides just carrots and string cheese. <laughs> Well, I can't believe it's been an hour. Um, I am sure that every attendee um, feels the way I do. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for putting it in a framework that we can all use and work with no matter where we are, because we can do our own homework on our own local and state, you know, requirements or mandates or whatever will happen but the framework you've presented today partly because you're ahead of the game you've been doing this for a long time um you know you were on the forefront i understand when ihiv started happening you were on the forefront of that so um thank you for sharing your wisdom and years of experience cindy acker um, Sarah Lavalley, Michael Dorr, and Christine Lowry, thank you. Montessori Foundation thanks you, and Montessori Foundation appreciates um, our Montessori community. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks so much, Cindy. Mm -hmm. I, I really, really love the wonderful open mindset that has made all of this. I mean, it, it has to come from that that place of being open. It, like you, I love that you said throwing away the box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's it's funny, Tanya. You you touched on the two places where we we've, we've had so much discussion um, trying to pull all of this together and there were two places in which I said okay we stop stop because we were just we just couldn't get anywhere we couldn't get anywhere with snack and lunch um and I forget what was the other one Sarah we had to come back to uh what was the other one I, I've I written down I'm not but sure we, we just said okay no more discussion today we just need to drop it and breathe and just open it up again and try again so well the truth the truth is is that we we no one knows i mean in the collective wisdom of human experience michael help me out here we always had our our elders to go to like you, what do we do now you know we always had at least tidbits of wisdom among our ourselves and our culture we don't have any of that anymore that's that's kind of that's kind of like you know i mean everyone i talk to no matter how um you know old they are or what they've gone through you know i'm talking to 94 year old people who said not in my lifetime i have yeah. no idea um but what i do know and what i'm concerned most about and this is a conversation um that you and I have always had and shared when we're at IMC conferences is that we tend to experiment with the most vulnerable. Yeah. We tend, we are so much more willing to experiment with the most vulnerable. And yeah. right now, one of my dearest friends, she's, um, She's um, with legal services and she, you know, she's working with homeless and she's working with people who've been kicked out. And, and we forget when we talk about those people, all of those people in some way or another have children. And we're willing to now marginalize them for health. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, and those who educate and care for them. I mean, literally the and I, I didn't want to stay on my soapbox because I didn't want to scare teachers 
um, any more than they already are scared. But with it's it's with the the opening of anything, they're <laughs> opening preschool because they need people to take care of the children of those people who are going to go out and work. And so it's not it's not even a matter of whether or not it's safe or whether or not there's enough protective wear or anything else um, for those teachers. It's just that it's needed for the rest of the economy. And, and in that sense, the teachers are disposable. It's like they, they are not, they're not seeking to protect them to open, open things up. And I'm just baffled by that. I'm just baffled by that. Well, I'm hoping that I stopped the recording. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are still though 97 people with us. Just right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is, but um, I, yeah. Well, we we just have to work together um on all of this and support each other on what we know is uh is, you know, the individual people that we care about that are in our own worlds, but all of us, we have a we have a golden opportunity here to to really support, you know, the marginalized professions in some way. Nurses, think of it, nurses, you know, EMTs, teachers, and early childhood. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There, there was an interesting email that came out from the MPPI yesterday. Um, I only very quickly skimmed it, but it was a call for action to mm -hmm. contact representatives to, um, Cindy, you, you know more about this. Can you finish it up for me? I know it had something to do with protecting early childhood um, programs and teachers. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't read it yet, so yeah. I'm not sure. But yeah, I imagine I, I, what other child care associations are, are sending out is that it's important that they, they need they need additional funding to meet right. the classroom requirements and they need PPE if they're going to be working with children. Right, exactly. Um, so if anybody, um, if anybody else is listening, if you look for that MPPI email or go to the um, Montessori Public Policy Initiative site, I'm sure that they have that call for action on their homepage. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. that's a, a small action that we can take collectively that might have big impact? Oh, I think so. I, I think so. I think the first year of um, when we had National Day of the Child and within that, that Thursday was a day for teachers and it was take your child to work day. Um, sure. People were in shock at what that would entail when school said we will not operate um, you take your child to work and know what how important it is for you to have your child here. And I think parents are getting a taste of that being home and being yeah. teachers that it's not easy. Um, yes. And so on on the basis of that, I, I think we need to lean on that and to say, no, it isn't easy, but look what you've done by by right. what your mandate is to us. Right. And, and another silver silver lining, another opportunity is how we can, um, the, the knowledge that we can share with parents, the, the support that we can give to parents, the um, helping them learn more about what Montessori means beyond a pink tower. Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, well, Cindy. I'm going gonna to hop off and thank you, Sarah, as well. It was good to see you, Michael. It was, good to see you, Tanya. Yeah, it was great to see you, Michael. We've missed you. You're doing well. You. Yeah, you've done. You're doing well. Yes, yes. I hope everybody here is. I, you all look well. So I've got to hop off. I have another meeting again. Zoom is there. You all are today. So <laughs> be well. Bye bye. Be well. Bye. Thank you. Bye.